Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Dr. Jane Pisano, President and Director of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Founded in 1910, it is the largest museum of its kind in the Western United States, with collections encompassing 35 million diverse specimens and artifacts covering 4.5 billion years of history. Prior to joining the Natural History Museum, Pisano served as the Dean of the USC School of Public Administration and as Senior Vice President for External Relations. Jane Pisano and her team have stewarded the museum through extraordinarily challenging times for natural history museums. She has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Jane, for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be here. So in my introduction, I talked about the extraordinarily challenging times for uh, natural history museums in particular. Could you talk a little bit about what you found when you came to this museum in 2001 and how you approached the, the challenges that, that you saw? Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about where you are today. I found an institution that was living in the past, which is, you might think, acceptable for a natural history museum. However, the museum, the, the, the researchers, the educators were not connecting. They really didn't have any idea about how to present material that was compelling in the 17th and 18th centuries to a 21st century audience. And it turns out that figuring that out was far greater than a communications problem. It was, it entailed a complete redefinition of who we are. Was it a question of, of people having learned their craft in a different time and started their careers in a different time and through inertia uh, repeating? Was it, was it a, a, a question of the institution itself um, being uh, an institution that is fundamentally designed in a different time? What were the factors that you felt led people to be um, so stuck in this, these past behaviors? Well, I think inertia breeds inertia. And it was an institution that really hadn't had a fresh idea in a long time and had a very difficult time balancing its books just to keep the doors open and the lights on. So, you know, sometimes when you're stuck like that, you don't understand that you really need to start over. And that's what we did. We really started thinking in a fundamentally different way. And we did it by saying, you know, we, we know that we're good at research. We know that we have large collections. What's wrong here? And what's wrong is that we'd forgotten about the visitor. We hadn't put the visitor at the center of our thinking. And once we started to do that, everything changed. Now, was the impetus for this, um, for this change in thinking, did it come from the staff, from the board, uh, from the visitors? Did it come from uh, financial realities? It came from the board. Came from the and board. the board was looking at attendance that was small and declining and at a uh, at a, a, the difficulty that the institution had in balancing its books on an annual basis. I, I think it's fair to say of the board that they thought that the museum was good, but that it could be so much better. Without knowing exactly what that so much better looked like, there was just a sense that um, the museum was doing things in an old way in a time of profoundly rapid change um, with audiences that no longer needed to go to the Natural History Museum to understand what um, the habitat is like in Africa. If they don't have the money to go to Africa, they surely can watch the Discovery Channel or National Geographic. So the whole world changed around them. And um, I, I have to say to the staff's great credit, um, you know, over time, they have gone there and been increasingly enthusiastic about doing things in new ways. And, and how did that express itself in board conversations in terms of the thinking of the board? Um, did they rush out and, and find a strategic consultant or a marketing consultant? Or um, uh, did they decide to do internal studies? 
actually, they did do a strategic plan. Okay. I was at the time on the board, a new member of the board, a kind of backbencher member of the board, but was fortunate enough to be asked to participate in a strategic planning process. The board included the senior staff, mm -hmm. so it was a board staff product, and everyone worked very hard on it. The, we didn't come up with a strategic plan per se, but everyone agreed on a new vision and new mission statement for the museum and a strategic plan framework. And that was the year before I was hired. And I think it's fair to say that I've spent the last nine years breathing life into that mission and vision and strategic plan framework because a, we couldn't turn things around overnight, and B, it wasn't crystal clear in the beginning how to walk the talk of this new language. In terms of how you approach this when you, when you came in, you have now consensus that there's an issue, but not necessarily consensus on the series of solutions. It must be a very lonely place to occupy. Actually, there wasn't consensus that we have an issue. Really? There was consensus among the board and those senior staff who had participated in the process. But there were many people who worked at the museum who, th who were perfectly happy doing what they were doing and wanted only to do what they were doing. Um, in other words, there really wasn't um, an, an, a focus on an overarching institutional good. The researchers touched the elephant and said, oh, this is a research institute. The uh, educators touched the elephant and said, oh, this is a place for moms with kids in strollers. The teachers thought we were serving their students, but there was almost no one who had a view of the whole elephant, of, of the whole institution. And without that, as you know, you cannot think strategically and you cannot make strategic choices with scarce resources um, and do that consistently in order to achieve certain goals and objectives. So the first thing that we had to do, really literally, was show the staff sort of the nonprofit business model. Yes, the board had a right to adopt the mission and vision statement. That's their role, is to provide a sense of direction. But it's the staff's role to come together and talk about how to do it. We had to teach people about budgeting so they understood that the money that they were allocated at the beginning of the year, they wouldn't get if we didn't get our revenues in that year. So there was a lot of education. Um, and there was a lot of trial and error on my part, too. Let's try stuff. Let's see what works and, and resistance to that idea. But over time, people became more accustomed to working with others to do strategic planning and eventually we got to a point where the I would say the first three levels of management of the institution truly fundamentally understood that this was one institution and that we all had a responsibility to think about institutional priorities rather than my budget. And there's also a, a period of grieving because when, when somebody has to change, and rather abruptly, and they're not necessarily prepared for change, one goes through a period of holding on to the past and grieving for the past. And that, that is encountered as resistance. There is a, there's a period in which people need to become accustomed to the idea that someday, sometime, they're going to have to behave fundamentally different than they had learned to behave in the past. And that's perfectly understandable. But once people get all, uh, have gotten over that, that, that grieving period, did, did people begin to engage first singly and then in groups? People began to engage singly and then in groups. But it wasn't really until there was a belief that, in fact, this change that was required in outlook and behavior was actually going to lead to something profoundly different that would be better. And that was the hard thing. Because in the beginning, when you're making change, all you have is your vision. You don't have any proof that you can achieve that vision, and yet you're asking people to give up the past. So uh, convincing people, yes, we can do things in another way, and something different will happen, was really the first step. 
but it was, it was the cumulative effect of some small changes leading to small results that began to break down resistance. I have to say, and now I'm nine years into it, that I felt the institution shift and understand why we were doing things in a different way when we opened Age of Mammals in July. And that is because they said, oh, that's it. That is what a natural history museum should be doing in the 21st century. And it had been done with the museum's own staff, not with a raft of outside consultants. So there was tremendous institutional pride, but also an understanding that could be visceral, that, that didn't come about as a result of my or somebody else saying, you know, trust me, this is going to work out. And I understand that, that, the, that the reaction of your visitors has been phenomenal. It's been stunning. Our attendance is up 40% still. And we opened this exhibit six months ago. The word of mouth is amazing. And it's accomplishing for us so many things. It's enabling us to walk the talk of our mission statement, which is to inspire wonder, discovery, and responsibility for our natural and cultural worlds. Well, we, like many natural history museums, are big on wonder. You know, you throw a few dinosaurs in there, there's a lot of wonder. You got me sold. Yeah. <laughs> but that, but discovery, that whole question of how do we know what we know, that process of scientific discovery is very prominent in our Age of Mammals exhibit, as is the responsibility piece, because we talk not only about plate tectonics and climate change and the evolution of mammals in the past and the present, but we look to the future. And your collections are amazing. They're it is stunning. one of the world's great, truly great collections in its depth, in its breadth, and it needs to be preserved. Preserving it, though, is an incredible expense and responsibility. But if the collections are for your visitors, for your audience, for the world, for the public, and all of a sudden it takes on a different meaning, it is something that we all have an interest in sustaining. And that then co connects to not only your mission, but to your fundraising efforts. Exactly. We start off with the transformation of the, of the public experience, but this also, and you, you implied as much, uh, this also required other transformations. Talk a little bit about the transformations that attend the transformation, of, uh, the strategic transformation of an institution like this. Well, they not only attend that transformation, that external transformation, but they make it possible. So I've referenced several times the fact that over time, the staff began to see the institution as a whole not their little piece of it, the my budget piece. I just get my budget and go off and do my thing. The single most important thing we did as a staff was to do our budgeting together. No more the director negotiating with a department head and then doing the next one. So you took Gone. away the, the, um, the luxury of defending turf. Exactly. Because if you're defending your turf, you've got somebody sitting across the table saying, well, wait a second, we're, we're, we're working off of the same pot. You take, you're go, you have to take from somebody, you're taking from me. So now you're creating an adjudicated process. Well, actually, it, it goes a step back, which is every year we do either a new strategic plan or a strategic plan update. So we've been basically doing strategic plan updates. But before we ever have one conversation about the budget, we, are, we have conversations about what need to be the institution's strategic priorities. So your strategic plan doesn't gather dust? Never. We use it always. And, I'll, and we use it even in the course of a year, too. because as, So those strategic priorities are the things that get baked into the budget based on what we think our revenues are likely to be. Now, and we organize them in priority order. So if we only have the money to do the top three, that's all we do, but we put the rest on hold to be revisited in January when we do our forecast. But there's something else that goes along with this, which is as the year goes on, when there are salary savings, when there are savings of any kind, if it's over a certain threshold, every department head has to throw that money back in a pot. 
And in January, we say, hmm, what are the issues that we didn't get to? Are those still our priorities? Has something else come up? Or is there some big unmet need that's popped up? And we reprioritize. And sometimes we say, oh, there's a whole set that we're going to leave till the last two months of the year because they're absolutely visitor friendly. There would be nice to haves, not must haves. And if we decide we have the money, we'll spend it in the last couple months of the fiscal year. But it's no more the department head saying, oh, I've got this money squirreled away. I'm going to go out and buy everybody a new computer. It's very institutionally focused as opposed to departmentally focused. So now strengthening the institution has a meaning for the entire institution. And while somebody might have to give up something, they'll get it back on some other initiative that they might value. And with resources, you can do bigger things rather than a lot of little things that might not be optimally functional for, for your own purpose. Right. Or they might not. They might say, I mean, here, here's an example. They might say, oh, I get it. For the next three years, we are so committed to doing these new exhibits, to upgrading all our visitor amenities, because that's where we have to be right now. And in three years, we know we'll get back to funding research positions, but we can't do it now. So it's not just uh, you know, a give and take within the context of a year. You have to take the long view. But the reason it works is because of the strategic planning framework and, and the performance metrics that we have around that so that everybody understands where we're going, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and we report, we measure our progress and report that not only to the leadership team but to the whole staff. So it's indicative of a changed attitude. It's no longer my department, it's, it's my museum. Exactly, exactly. And I truly do not believe that we could have had the extraordinary creative collaboration between the researchers and the educators and all the people and the exhibit experts that's required to produce a, an extraordinary exhibit if we had not had all these other internal processes working collegially and with a big view at the same time. I hate to sound trite. Are people happier in this institution Absolutely. than they were in the institution that you came in? Without question. Uh, when I came, it, everything was, was the traditional stovepipes. Wouldn't have been a natural history museum without that. Um, and it was even worse than that because people had personal friendships. And that's how they got things done across the stovepipes. The, the um, channels of communication were so clogged at the top and everybody was so focused on their stovepipe that it was difficult for someone deep in the organization to make anything happen. Now we have teams. All right, we have a fabulous guest relations team. And we have everybody on that team from people who are selling tickets to vice presidents and everybody in between. And they say, you know, we could make the visitor experience better if we did this, or I observed that, or this is a bottleneck. I, I'm no, I've never been to one of those meetings. But they work it out. They figure out what to do. They put it in place. They feel so empowered. The people who are closest to what's going on are the ones who are making the decision. And it's all across departments. How has your role changed from the early days to today? Are you involved in different things? Is your day different today than it was uh, previously? Well, of course, I'm spending more time fundraising. but Well, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Because in contrast to what were you doing previously? Well, I was, I was trying to kind of get the place running smoothly so that it could be a high performance organization. And while I don't think we're perfect, I think we've moved so far along that, um, along that path that the people who report to me are the ones who are the real troubleshooters and problem solvers. So were you previously your own troubleshooter? Were you the person who had to say, no, we can't do this, no, we need to do that? And, and today, you're in a more affirmative role. Yes, exactly. It, it, before, there was just too much of me in too many day-to-day -day decisions, and that's gone. And I, I find that I'm able to be more of a coach than somebody who goes in and makes all the decisions. And I like that, and I think it's really important. And it's the way you keep um, a group of high-powered people with different professional expertise um, working together. 
the Natural History Museum, in addition, is in such profound change that everyone there does windows. We're redoing 100,000 square feet of internal space, including huge improvements Excellent. in visitor amenities, and five acres of outdoor space. So it's not only I, but my direct reports are both doing the work and managing and supervising and leading the work. What are you doing with the exterior space? Well, we have consolidated our parking, mm -hmm. and that has, so that's two acres, and that has freed up three and a half acres of land that was formerly hardscape to enable us to have teaching learning gardens outside. Oh, that's wonderful. So with the Southern California climate, we, it is now possible for us to become a museum of nature as well as natural history. And it really is a game changer for us. It lets us walk the talk of the mission in terms of discovery and responsibility, that stewardship piece, in a way that, uh, in, that's far greater than what we could accomplish with a, an exhibit. In an inner city urban environment. Yes. These transformations now are having a big impact on the educational uh, programming. Talk a little bit about your thoughts surrounding education going forward and its importance in this institution? I think of education really in two domains. Uh, programming, which is all the, uh, the wonderful educational activities we have for people of all ages who walk through the door on any day of the week in family groups or twos or threes. And then the program, the education that we do for our school children who come mm -hmm. with their teachers. We're well along uh, the road with very successful programming, innovative programming for people who walk through the door. We have a junior scientist program that any child age 5 to 12 uh, can participate in on a monthly basis that's fabulous. We have Critter Club for kids from 3 to 5. We have First Fridays, very cool bands and music. We get 2,000 people. I, I attended, uh, well, it, was, it was great. And all sorts of people were coming in and just relaxing. Just rela coming to the museum simply to recreate. Yeah, having a great time. So those are examples of very successful programs. We, we know how to do it. We know how to target. With regard to K-12 education, we're, we're still experimenting. It, it, this is a model that's not yet finalized. But we've done something that's quite wonderful. We've started with teachers who are very familiar with the requirements of the California state curriculum standards and who are also very close to us and know what we have to offer. So they have put together lesson plans. All of a sudden you, you uh, bring in an intermediary who has a real interest in leveraging the museum for their purposes, educating right. their kids. Right. And, and they're starting to shape and interacting with you, shaping that education process. It, there's something else about it too. Everything you say is true. And the other thing that's true is that we have, we're really saying to teachers, we don't have all the answers. We need you to be co-creators of our content. So now they become a partner, a strategic exactly. partner of exactly. the museum, and the museum becomes their strategic partner mm -hmm. in their classroom. So we're not 100% there yet. But that's the approach, and we're, we're, we're moving there. And I think it's been well received so far. It's really interesting to hear how you've taken a, an institution that was fundamentally designed during the Victorian age, mm -hmm. the Natural History Museum, and transforming it into this internet age of active learning and interest and dialogue. You know, speaking of that, we've done something else very interesting. We've made a big investment in a collections management database mm -hmm. so that when our curators put a digitize a, a part of our collection and describe it, anybody who's at the museum can access it. And where we're heading is that anyone can access it from home. So a kid who's, going, who's doing a research paper, you know, yes, we want them to come to the museum, and that's the goal. But the resource that the museum can provide via the web will be so much greater than anything we've been able to do before. So it's, it, it's involvement now in the research of the institution itself and on, on advancing knowledge. 
or if somebody comes and has a lovely day and they say, you know, I really want to learn more about that object that I saw. You know, where we're headed is they'll be able to go online and pull up that object and read everything that we know about it. Well, Dr. Pisano, it's been such a pleasure to, to chat with you and to work with you. Thank you so much for providing us with your insights. Thank you, Mark.